Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I want to talk to you about the solar PV industry, my take on uh, what's happening in that industry and where it's going. Um, it's obviously a topic that we read a lot about in the papers these days. Um, we uh, in particular have heard about companies like Apple, Kaiser Permanente, uh, also Stanford University, not a corporation, but a, still a large electricity consumer, uh, signing big utility scale deals in recent weeks and months. Um, People like Al Gore are uh, on record now to say that uh, they believe solar has actually reached cost parity with other traditional electricity sources. And so uh, I guess that all of that sort of uh, pre um, suggested the uh, subtitle that I chose here is solar becoming red hot. Um, and uh, I basically would like to tell you sort of the economic analysis that we have been doing uh, at the business school. I've been doing this with two colleagues and I'm going to sort of weave in two research projects um, that we have been doing in that domain uh, in, as part of uh, this conversation. So um, one thing I think we can all agree on, and that is simply growth in solar capacity installations, uh, as you see here over the last 15 years. Um, uh, it has been uh, spectacular by any measure, just in terms of the growth rates that have been sustained over that time period. As you may be able to see, depending on how far in the back you are, um, the Europeans early on had um, uh, the majority of those installations. They still account for the majority, but that curve is now uh, sort of leveling out. Um, the uh, Asia Pacific part is growing rapidly, China in particular. And uh, on top of it, the Americas, largely the US, is finally getting uh, into that market or into, into that industry. Uh, here's a breakdown by country, uh, and uh, perhaps most remarkable, Germany uh, has been shouldering a large part of the cumulative burden that's on the right up to till, till uh, the end of 2014. Uh, countries like China now are catching up, and if you see uh, in terms of the additions in 2014 alone, uh, China accounts for almost one-third of its total cumulative uh, installations. In other words, uh, China being, of course, an important producer of solar PV modules has in recent years also become a consumer and has installed these uh, at a very uh, fast rate. So if I look at sort of the U.S. and ask what has been behind the rapid growth in the U.S. market alone, uh, I think there are a variety of factors, and part of what we're trying to do uh, in these studies is to disentangle and quantify the different effects that have contributed to this very rapid growth here. Um, there's first and foremost uh, technological improvements and cost reductions at the level of the PV modules, uh, but also other parts of the hardware have been coming down in cost rapidly. And then uh, the next part of this uh, has been changes really in the way uh, the industry and businesses have been conducting um, those uh, deployments. Um, the industry is probably becoming more vertically integrated. Say in the US companies like SunPower, which traditionally used to be a manufacturer of uh, solar panels, now integrating downward into uh, the developing side also. Uh, and companies like SolarCity which traditionally have been in the installation uh, business, integrating back upwards and now also becoming a module manufacturer. So that seems to be, at least for some major US players, uh, a trend towards more vertical integration. Uh, companies like SolarCity also have been uh, pioneers in the way they have uh, financed um, these deployments, these investments, uh, the way they have presented packages to investors uh, be they individual homeowners or companies. Uh, and perhaps the, uh, probably the most um, significant uh, change there, the securitization of lease claims uh, that go hand in hand with these deployments uh, has arguably lowered the cost of capital for these companies considerably. And I'll in a moment sort of show you how important that has been in terms of the overall calculations. Finally, and that's the part that I'm probably going to spend the most time on, on here in the, in the next uh, 30 or so minutes, uh, federal uh, policy and also state level policy. At the federal level, the investment tax credit that was given to solar uh, 
uh, about five to six years ago uh, in the amount of 30 percent. That will not, is not scheduled to stay there, and that's an issue uh, that we're going to pay particular attention to, but also other forms of tax incentives in the form of accelerated depreciation. Uh, in addition, at the state level, many states have enacted renewable portfolio standards, which have also given a boost uh, to solar, but also other forms of renewables. Uh, and that is uh, probably among all the lists that are, all the items that I'm listing here, the smallest item, but should not be forgotten if we're trying to explain uh, the rapid growth in this industry over the last five or six years. By the way, feel free to interrupt any time. Uh, if uh, I'd be happy to make this a dialogue all along. So uh, in terms of questions, the first one probably to ask in my mind is, how competitive is solar PV today? Uh, and to assess that, we, uh, this is part of a study that we have done for the Department of Energy recently. We have uh, looked at the three main segments of this industry, utility scale, commercial, and residential, uh, and the numbers vary quite a bit. Uh, and we've also picked five sample states that you see listed there on the slide. Uh, those cumulatively account for probably close to 70% of all solar deployments in the U.S. in the first place. Um, the next question then, after uh, we've answered the first one, is how important is the change in the tax code uh, that is anticipated in early 2017 when the investment tax credit uh, is currently uh, scheduled to go from 30 to 10 percent. How much of a difference would that make? Um, and then what I would like to sketch at the end is uh, basically a proposal that we have worked out recently as part of this Department of Energy study that I mentioned, which tries to sketch an alternative uh, to this step down that is currently envisioned in the law and replaces it by a gradual phase down. Uh, and I want to just show you some numbers to uh, give you a sense of how that might work uh, and how it would, uh, in our minds, alter the path that the industry in the US uh, is likely to take if um, current law is not changed. OK, so first question, what's a good metric here in all of this? Uh, the one that we're using is a traditional one, uh, which has been uh, discussed a lot. Uh, and also criticized in, in certain quarters, we think it's still a good workhorse. Uh, the levelized cost of electricity, you may have heard the term, basically looks at, is a soup to nuts concept where you're looking at the entire investment uh, from the initial installation um, of uh, the system, you're operating it for the next 25 years and you try to take into consideration all the costs and you're backing out from it a revenue figure that's what an investor would need to obtain on average, on average is uh, the operative word here, per kilowatt hour in order to break even on this investment. In terms of components, uh, there are basically fixed operating costs on an annual basis. Those tend to be relatively small. Think of just maintenance uh, of the facility. Uh, the big ticket item is the unit cost of capacity, where you're taking the initial systems price and um, levelizing it or annuitizing it over the lifespan of this investment. And the factor that we're going to pay particular attention to if when we want to look at the importance of uh, tax policy in this area is uh, what's called the tax factor. And that takes basically everything into consideration related to income taxes, investment tax credits, and the like. That's all sort of baked into that third factor. So. Uh, in terms of, as I said, we're trying to do this by applications in different regions of the US and also uh, in terms of different applications, that is the size of uh, the solar facilities. So for PV module costs, it's pretty much the same across the different applications. But once you get to the so-called balance of systems cost, everything other than uh, the, uh, the modules themselves, you will have some variation both depending on geography and on the, on the application itself. Um, big factor for solar, of course, is simply the amount of sunshine, so the insulation factor. That makes a large difference. And finally, the whole question of what's the applicable cost of capital that goes into these life cycle cost calculations. 
Um, that also varies in our mind by application and also a little bit by geography. Uh, we're working sort of with numbers there in the range of 6.5 to 9%, and I'll show you some numbers later on in terms of how sensitive things are to those specifications. So here is our reading, our current reading sort of of the tea leaves where we are uh, in 2016. So we're going slightly forward looking to say the middle or the end of 2016. And the numbers you have, see in the tables, if you could focus sort of for a moment on the first column uh, for each of the four applications, utility, commercial, and residential. And for utility, we're distinguishing both silicon and thin film. Um, so say, pick California for a moment. We have a number of, at the moment, or 2016, of about 6.9 cents per kilowatt hour as this levelized or life cycle cost. Um, now, to some people, that may sort of seem a little high. We have already seen better numbers. Uh, but that takes into consideration here our numbers here that we're basically doing a broad average, so we're not taking sort of the perfect location uh, within California. Uh, we're also ignoring uh, any state-level incentives in, the, in these numbers, so that in a state like California, we, tend, we have a tendency to make the numbers even lower, even better than um, what uh, we included in our calculations. Perhaps most importantly, if you now take this to Alternatives, say a natural gas type facility, um, we're pretty close. Uh, our numbers suggest even at the very low natural gas prices that we're seeing at the moment, um, this is a close horse race. Uh, perhaps uh, the number for natural gas, depending on how you calculate, comes in somewhere in the range of 6.4 to 6.7 cents. So solar, from that perspective, is really catching up very, very rapidly. Um, what we have in the second column are comparison prices. So not necessarily a natural gas power plant, but um, the question in California, if you peg it to wholesale electricity prices, that's in the second column there. Um, and if you go uh, over to commercial and residentials, those comparisons, those benchmarks change, of course, because we're looking at essentially what a business that is contemplating to put solar panels on its warehouse rooftops would have to pay if it worked with the local utility. And again, this, these are broad averages. This does, in the present form, not take into consideration that these electricity rates vary a great deal throughout the day. Uh, there are ways to adjust and account for that, uh, but um, I'll, I'll have to leave that for another day, so to speak. Um, finally, there are the numbers in red almost everywhere. And this is basically now a levelized cost calculation in which we are anticipating that by 2017, unless Congress changes its mind, the investment tax credit were to go from 30 to 10%. So those subscripts, 30 represents 30%, and 10 means 10% in the third column here. Um, what's striking in my mind is uh, now sort of talk about solar catching on uh, and being really close to being competitive in many of the applications is reversed just about across the board. So all the red numbers, the red numbers are not the ones necessarily in the third column, but the ones that are uh, indicating that we are above the comparison price. In other words, um, the investor that's looking, trying to earn a normal return on their investment uh, relative to the current comparison prices would find solar unattractive at that point in time. And you see the only uh, application that we have been able to identify is that um, commercial in California at 14 cents per kilowatt hour would still uh, look like a good buy, but everything else uh, would be, as we put it here, underwater. Okay? Perhaps one word on sort of sensitivities of these calculations. Um, uh, so I refer to this sort of as a spider graph here in um, the center of my little grid, I have zero, zero. That's also, if you want to, the baseline calculations. And now you ask, well, if you vary uh, one or several of these factors, in particular in the blue line, the capacity factor, uh, largely driven by location and or efficiency of uh, the cells, what impact does that have on the levelized cost of electricity um, for a solar system? And uh, just to put that in perspective, if you had a 50% cut 
in your capacity factor because you're moving into a less favorable location in the world. Um, talked about Germany earlier. Germany's insulation factor, at least if you go sufficiently far north in Germany, is probably about one half of what it is here in California. You're pretty much doubling your levelized cost of electricity. So that's how sensitive uh, solar and solar's competitiveness is to location. Um, on the uh, yellow golden line or the red line here, the impact of um, both the system price, um, so that's basically what we're talking about when we look at reductions in module prices or balance of systems costs, how sensitive that is. And the red line, cost of capital, uh, again, all on a percentage basis. And you see all of them have um, very, very rapid impact on these uh, levelized cost calculations. So things are quite sensitive with respect to these three factors if you want to sort of try to uh, forecast where things are going in the future. Okay, let me uh, do for a moment sort of the two, yes, go ahead. That depends on the application. So we have for utilities, we have put in a, co a weighted average cost of capital of 7%. And for residentials, we have gone all the way up to 85 to 9%. So it depends on the application. And it's also a little tailored to the state. Okay. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the dynamics of these system price costs. And the two main components uh, I mentioned earlier being the modules and the balance of systems. This chart here is probably known to many of you. Uh, it's uh, sometimes referred to as uh, Moore's law of uh, the solar PV industry. Uh, it was, I saw it here first in a seminar, uh, I guess it was one of Sally's energy talks on, on the Monday afternoon in 2011. Dick Swanson, the uh, founder of SunPower, presented it. Um, and what you see on the axis here is cumulative total production uh, measured in megawatts of solar PV modules. And over on the other axis, you have price. Both of these are on a logarithmic scale uh, rather than the actual prices. So if you had these in terms of actual numbers, you would have a very steep uh, uh, convex curve. Um, what's remarkable about this is uh, it has held up for, as you see, they are close to 30 years. And at the seminar in uh, 2011, the question was, well, that's really great, but this can't possibly go on like this. Uh, this industry must run out of steam pretty soon. This is a very impressive uh, pace of cost reductions over 30 years, but obviously sooner or later, you know, you're going to hit a wall there. Uh, this also, uh, for, for people in, in uh, business schools, uh, the nice thing about this curve is it corresponds almost too well to be true to what's known as an 80% learning curve. That is, with every doubling of cumulative production, you cut your cost by 20%. So it's only 80% of what it was before. Uh, and again, if somebody shows you that graph, you would think, you know, uh, this, is, this can't be true that it comes out that cleanly. The, there's a little uh, hump there in red. Uh, commonly attributed to a shortage of polysilicon around those years. Uh, but then the industry also got back pretty much to the historic trend line with remarkable uh, uh, accuracy. So again, the, line, the, the uh, conclusion at the time was in 2011, well, this can't go on. Um, guess what? Uh, not only did it go on, but it got even faster. <laughs> Uh, and as many of you know, so what I have in this graph here is simply, I haven't done anything other than extrapolated in red this 80% learning curve beyond what we had in 2011 when Swanson gave the talk and also tracked the average sales prices in blue uh, since then. And um, of course, the remarkable thing is starting in 2011, while this was a pretty close fit all along, um, the bottom seems to be falling out here. Uh, and that coincidental, of course, was a new wave of manufacturers, most of them from China, entering the industry. Uh, and generally, the industry also being perceived as hurting, uh, most of the players uh, being highly unprofitable during those years. 
So the interesting thing then in our minds is to try to disentangle, well, what's going on here is to what extent are the observed prices a consequence of excess capacity, which may have been created for whatever reason, we can speculate, and to what extent is it, does it actually reflect uh, sustained cost reductions? Because there's also a reason to believe that the you know, innovations have gone on during those years. So trying to disentangle those two effects uh, is one of the things we were trying to do in one of the studies. Um, and uh, this is with uh, uh, one of my colleagues at the Business School and at the Schleyer Taylor Center here on Susaho. Uh, what we have done is basically now gone and looked at the financial statements of about a dozen companies in the industry, uh, most of them from China, relatively pure players in this market, and have basically looked at annual reports to try to get at cost information, and then from the cost information try to back out what prices should have been, would have been in this industry had it been in equilibrium. So it's basically sort of an industrial organization type study where you're backing prices out from the underlying cost structure. Of course, as researchers, we're a little limited in terms of what we can do because we have to rely largely on the financial statements and some industry association data. So it would be nicer if we had sort of really inside cost data, but we didn't have that, at least not for um, the uh, dozen or so companies looked at. So what we get at the end of this day is basically the green line and the green line is what we term economically sustainable prices. These are the prices that um, we should have seen if firms in the, if this industry had been in an equilibrium and firms would have made a normal profit. Now, once again, they didn't. Um, but what's, in my mind, sort of uh, noteworthy about it is there is really a pretty close hug here between the blue and the green line. So average sales prices were roughly in line with what we infer the cost structure of these firms to be. But things start to diverge really in 2011. Um, and if you now think about sort of the historic trend line, the actually observed prices, and uh, the inferred economically sustainable prices, the distance between the green, and the green and the blue line, that becomes ultimately sort of our measure of the impact of excess capacity. Because if things had sort of stayed in balance and the cost structure would have um, sort of been where it is, then we should have seen prices at the green line. So that's sort of our measure of excess there. You can use this type of analysis now also to go forward and sort of say, OK, so given this trend line in costs, if we now extrapolate and basically sort of go back to ask the question, where are we going to be? you know, two or three years down the road. So our study ends in 2013, and pretty soon we'll be able to update it when the 2014 numbers are all in. Um, what we're finding actually, what uh, again surprised us a little bit here, the so-called 80% learning curve is alive and well. Uh, so any worries that have been expressed that, uh, you know, this industry would hit a wall and would not be able to maintain uh, this pace of innovations. We don't see that in the numbers. Actually, if anything at all, it's slightly faster than the 80%. We're arriving at a 78% learning curve, so you would be reducing your cost by more than 20% with every doubling. So, um, so far, at least uh, as far as modules are concerned, uh, there is no reason to believe that things are going to slow down. That, of course, is before we're talking about any of the breakthroughs that people are waiting for uh, sort of uh, with other technologies. This is just all focused on uh, crystalline PV. Okay. Um, last point then, balance of systems. Here we have less in uh, data, uh, but we've been sort of looking around basically at various industry association reports, conducted some interviews, try to get a sense of where in, this, in those remaining part balance of systems costs used to be the not so interesting part of the overall systems prices because it was small in comparison uh, to modules. But of course that has changed now. Balance of systems ac accounts for more than half. And if you're going into the residential uh, market, substantially more than one half. Um, Mentioned vertical integration before, but uh, you know companies like Solar City around here and a couple of others I think have shown uh, basically a number of measures that really 
just in terms of bringing that balance of system costs down have been uh, rather powerful. And so in forecasting things, we're willing to work with roughly a 5% cost improvement on average each year uh, for the time frame that, we're going to, uh, that I'm going to project out here in a moment. Okay. So where does all of this leave us? Cost reductions uh, likely to continue at the pace that I had sort of indicated for modules and balance of systems costs. Uh, now bring in the role of the federal government and tax policy in all of this. Um, unless there is a change in Washington, uh, this investment tax credit would drop from 30 to 10 percent. However, it's also intended to stay there at 10 percent um, without any sunset provision, without any termination. So that in our minds sort of really raises the question, is that a reasonable way to go? Uh, where you, the industry would experience this sharp step down, and I showed you earlier the numbers in terms of what this would do to the levelized cost calculations and the competitiveness. Um, but then you would also continue with indefinite uh, tax uh, support uh, really beyond that at the 10% level. And 10% plus the uh, accelerate, the depreciation uh, benefits still is a very substantial type of uh, subsidy in this case. So another way to slice this, in my mind, um, this is the proposal that uh, I've been working doing with another uh, colleague here at the business school, is to actually say, well, rather than have this sharp one-time step down, replace it by a gradual phase down. And to the extent that some kind of quid pro quo is needed here to get a deal in Congress, also say, well, we're not going to do this forever. Uh, we're only going to do this for 10 years. And then uh, they, if you want to, in return, for, to give the industry a little bit more early on, we would be saying then um, even the 10% investment tax credit could, would go away. So here is a uh, illustration of what we have in mind, just conceptually. Uh, this is when the ITC is supposed to drop from 30 to 10%, and correspondingly, the levelized cost would shoot up the numbers I showed you in the table earlier. So we have sort of an in-between regime for the next uh, four years, 2017 through 2020. That would then bring with it a first bump, but much smaller than the one we're talking about. And since there is sort of some headroom lift in the numbers that I showed you early on, that in our mind would not be a cliff, but it would just be, uh, if you want to, a small bump in the road. And then you would do the same thing a second time in 2020 for uh, all the way through December of 2024, at which point then you would revert back to absolutely no subsidies at that point in time. So the question then is how are these numbers calculated that give rise to the red line? Um, one idea here in all of this is if you think about it on a, uh, in terms of dollars per watt, the subsidy, of course, is very relatively high for residential systems, which have the highest system price. So one, uh, as part of this uh, proposal that we have been evaluating and doing the numbers on, um, the suggestion would be to give investors a choice between a reduced percentage investment tax credit, which we're putting initially at 20 rather than 10 percent, or a lump sum amount, and you see the initial lump sum amount we're suggesting there is 40 cents per watt. Um, the idea being a targeted incentives so that at the end of the day, the residential uh, systems would opt for the lump sum 40 cents, while commercial and utility scale would still stick with the percentage-based ITC. Next question then is, well, where does the 40 cents come from? Uh, we didn't quite pull it out of thin air, but we did a calculation basically along the lines of if you compare solar to uh, a fossil fuel alternative and you put a price on carbon and you now do a calculation of the avoided carbon emissions because you're doing solar as opposed to burning natural gas and you evaluate that over the lifetime of the investment, 40 cents actually uh, pops out as the number here. Uh, 
uh, that would basically think, you can think of this as sort of a negative carbon tax as a subsidy that you're offering the solar investments. Um, the nice thing is, so that's how we calculated the numbers. If you now run this through and evaluate it uh, over uh, those uh, periods, you are, uh, of course, encountering those bumps at two points in time. But I would say relative to um, the sharp step-down scenario that uh, I showed early on, those bumps are relatively small and would keep uh, solar in many of the applications either competitive or pretty close to it. I like the concept of your, um, your, your lump sum payment. Is that in the same form as the uh, grant was, uh, where it, you wouldn't have to have the tax equity? It would basically be a grant. You don't have to go give away half your margin to a tax equity provider? Um, yes. So I, I think there are certain similarities. Um, whether you would still, at the end of the day, uh, I think we have calculated it in such a fashion that you still would need the tax appetite. But that's something you know one could consider, that it would basically be targeted to people who don't need that. It would just be a lump sum amount. Uh, it would be a lot more valuable that way. Oh, I, and, I, and I believe that. <laughs> opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so uh, bottom line here is this would be uh, uh, those numbers uh, would be sufficient to keep things either at competitive levels or very close. Uh, again, in most of the states, New Jersey is one application, one exception to what I said, but the other four states uh, and most of the applications, uh, this would work, uh, and it would have, in my mind, obvious advantages in terms of uh, the impact on the industry. So let me conclude then. Um, if there is no change in the tax code, we are predicting, at least for the US industry, uh, what we call a cliff here. Um, and when I started out this whole talk by the question, is solar PV becoming red hot? Um, yes, it is red hot at the moment, but probably partly in anticipation of the fact that um, the tax code is, very, is likely to change, at least, unless uh, something happens. Um, if it were to happen, uh, I think there would be an undesirable boom and bust cycle uh, for the next year and a half uh, that, in my mind, should be avoided. Um, what our numbers basically speak to is what it would take. Um, and again, you have to sort of uh, uh, take my word for it or look at our report to see uh, that this alternative phase-down um, scenario would go a long way towards smoothing this path into the future. And the interesting thing, of course, is beyond 2024, if the trend lines continue, we project that beyond uh, another 10 years, uh, even without any uh, incentives in the tax code, solar would be able to stand on its own feet in m most of these applications. Okay. Uh, this is only for the US. Um, predictions are dangerous, in particular when they concern the future. I'll go out on a limb here and say, uh, I'll go and say, uh, uh, within the next 10 to 15 years, uh, regardless of what happens in the U.S. and what happens to the U.S. tax code, I think uh, prospects look pretty bright for solar PV compared to uh, the current uh, technologies we're aware of. Okay. Thank you. Hmm? Thank you. There are indirect uh, subsidies um, uh, uh, that uh, you didn't mention. Uh, actually, from the California ISA point of view, solar is eligible intermittent resource. That means that they have to buy it uh, no matter it stabilizes system or not. So they actually have, somebody has to pay for spinning reserve uh, to keep it uh, intact. On the uh, residential side, uh, it is, uh, Basically, um, you can. Uh, it's there is feed-in tariff, but to maintain uh, um, stability of the system, uh, you either load the grid with a large variation, or you have to buy a battery. So you can think about it as a cost of the battery. And uh, this uh, this subsidy, though it exists, uh, there are several uh, processes that, uh, uh, in the sense uh, of uh, that, are aimed at reducing it. Can you comment on anything, anything uh, about that? Will it change your analysis? 
So um, the numbers say, since you mentioned one form, uh, let's look at residential installations for a moment. Um, uh, the numbers that we have presented and studied here definitely do assume that there is net metering and that um, if you have solar panels on your rooftop, you can buy or sell an unlimited quantity uh, at any point in time at the rate at which you are being um, charged by the, by the utility, your residential rate. Now, that, as we know, is something that's currently uh, being debated. Uh, the utilities uh, would like to get to different types of uh, structures. Um, if that went away, I mean, if I sort of look at sensitivity, if you want to think of this as a form of a subsidy uh, and the sensitivity of the numbers, if you took that away, um, uh, the residential numbers would uh, shoot up dramatically. That is, if, if you did not have the ability at peak times to sell back to the grid at exactly the same rate that you're being charged uh, at other times. I don't know, is that, uh, I just picked one aspect. I, hmm? uh, on, another part is, is about the same. Okay, hmm? <laughs> okay more questions. No? Okay, well, well thank you very much. Okay. Very welcome. Hmm?